Good evening, North Central Church. We're glad that you're joining us for our weekly Bible study, and uh, we just want to welcome you. Uh, we're going to be uh, turning this over to Pastor Gary here in just a moment. He's going to be leading us in the second part of his series that he started last week on uh, loving our neighbor. And uh, we're just going to turn over to, to Pastor Gary at this time and, and dive right in. I hope you have your Bibles, and I hope you're ready to chime in on, on uh, online and just uh, give your comments. So we welcome that, but uh, let's do it. All right. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll dive in. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege we have of coming together uh, in your name, reading your word, and uh, diving in to uh, learn more about who it is, God, that we are called to reach and to love. And, and Lord, we just pray that over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts God, that you would just minister to us, that your word would come alive, and Lord Jesus, that you would help us to find ways to apply uh, yes. what, what we're talking about, what you're wanting to show us tonight. We love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Luke chapter 10 is where we began last week with a new series called Who is My Neighbor? And um, if you have your Bibles, guys, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, it's just 12 verses long, but I think it helps to not only remind us of what was going on last week, but helps set the stage for tonight. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, goes this way. One day, an expert in the religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Eternal life. And Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? And the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. And the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Verse 30 says, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him up, and they left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, and when they saw the man lying there, when he saw the man lying there, he crossed over to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked up at him, uh, looked at him laying there, but all, all he also, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them up. Then he put the man on his don own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man, and if the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. The man asked him, who is my neighbor? Now, what we talked about last week was that the, this, this religious scholar, this lawyer, if you will, he was looking for a reason an angle, a loophole, something that would allow him to justify what his actions were. That was, the, that was the motive behind the question. He wanted to make sure that he could find a way to be right with God the way that he was already acting. He, he was measuring himself up against uh, what the law was, and, 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 he was wanting, and he felt like he was doing good on that first part, right? Love the Lord your God with all that you have. And he wanted to know how he was doing on the second part, depending on how Jesus would define that word neighbor. In other words, he was asking, who and how much do I have to love? Who and how much do I have to love? How much am I required to love people? Probably another way of saying it. Another, one, another way to ask is, he's saying, is there a metric? You know, is there a way for me to measure, you know, how much love, what does love require of me, right? That's what he's asking. Uh, how do you define the word neighbor? And, 
And depending on how you define it, how do I measure it against how I'm living, how I'm living right now? You know, my daily actions, the way that I'm living my life for the Lord. I, I'm doing good on this first part of loving God with all that I have, but but I want to know that I'm doing good here. I feel like I'm doing good here. It all depends, Jesus, on how you're defining the word neighbor, right? We would like to believe that loving my neighbor means loving the people who love me, or at least loving people who are lovable. Uh, loving my neighbor, therefore, means doing nice things for people who will probably do nice things back for me, right? There's, there's some, some return, there's some reward, some, some physical reward that I get in return for loving people who love me first, and that's how he's looking to define it. Um, here's the crazy thing about this story. Guys, and I know that you, you, you both are well aware of this, but Jesus defines neighbor with a story, but notice that Jesus never called this a parable. So in all likelihood, with Jesus and that entire crowd, just setting the stage here for a second, Jesus and that entire crowd that he was talking to, knowing what that road from Jerusalem to Jericho was like already, there is a good chance that Jesus is telling a story that really happened, actual and events. You know, it was known as the way of blood. So it was very believable what Jesus was saying, the story that he was telling. And there's some things that, that stand out to me that, that I want to jump into um, that we're going to kind of focus on. We're going fo- to hone in on that word compassion. He's, Jesus said that the good Samaritan walked over to him and felt compassion. There's some basic lessons concerning compassion that I want us to discuss today and, and really dive into. And one of them is this. And, and you guys feel free to jump in uh, at any point. It doesn't have, you don't have to wait for a question. And you guys as well, be sure to, to engage social media. If you're watching on Facebook whatever, or, uh, or whatever it is, be sure to engage as well. But here's the first thing about compassion that really stood out to me, and that is this. Compassion stirs us, right? It, it stirs something on the inside of us. Verse 33 said, but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He had compassion. Compassion stirs us. This wasn't a Jew taking care of another Jew, right? It wasn't a Samaritan taking care of another Samaritan. We know that that there was mutual hatred between those two people groups, right? And yet, this is what Jesus said happened. In fact, that very phrase, Good Samaritan, is, 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 is relevant in our, in our conversations today. It's a, it's a very commonly used term, commonly used language. He had this, and that word compassion there has this connotation of a gut feeling, right? He had a gut feeling that he ought to help this person. Have you ever had a gut feeling about anything? I love this um what the word says about this Samaritan and his ability to show compassion. I think that we all, everybody, I think that we all have a measure of compassion that's given to us. But I think part of our, our, um, I guess our tendency is to shut our eyes to compassion, shut our eyes to what's happening around us, shut our eyes to the, the person who's on the corner with a cardboard sign that says, I need money. And I think when we see that, then we have, a, we, have a, we have an obligation, we have a choice. Do I, do I show compassion or do I just turn the other way? Because we've all been there. I, I've been there. Um, but I think it's what do we do with that compassion that the Lord gives us? Are we, are we willing to um, open our eyes instead of shutting our eyes down to this? And are we willing to be humble? And are we willing to then show compassion, whether it's in the form of a word, encouraging word, money, whether it's a form of uh, just bringing this person aside and just caring for them, whatever, whatever compassion looks like for you. But my answer to that is I think that we all have a measure and a level of compassion. But in regards to us, I think that it's up to us to show that, just like the Samaritan did. The least likely person to show compassion for this person was the Samaritan. Right, and I would just add to that, that that I believe, even in this story, it doesn't say that that the priest had walked by. It didn't say that he didn't have compassion. It didn't say that 
he wasn't concerned, uh, the, the, the temple assistant, but sometimes compassion isn't high enough on our priority list. And uh, in, instead of stopping and, and, and helping this man, maybe they had an appointment that they had to make. They just were too busy, didn't have the time, didn't feel like they could sacrifice the time. And I think Jesus is pointing that out in, in being compassionate about somebody is taking that moment, you know, moving that up in your priority. What's more important, this appointment that I have to get to or caring for somebody that's dying, somebody that's, that's, that's hurting. And uh, I think he's trying to point that out as well. I think that's good. I think I think you're both right, spot on there, and and I think what stood out, what what, because it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that the first two men didn't have any compassion. But what it does say is that the third man responded to the stirring. Right. He he responded to what was happening in his in his gut, if you will. To him, compassion wouldn't allow him just to pass by. It was, maybe it was just higher up on his priority list, yeah. right? But re- regardless of, 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 of uh, what the scenario was with each person, for the third person, for the good Samaritan, for the Samaritan, it wouldn't allow him just to pass by. And it's because compassion stirs us. He didn't decide to help this guy on a basis of how worthy he was. Right. He helped him because of how needy he was. He saw a man in need. And you know, this has probably, you know, when you become a dad, you know, or a parent, um, you, you view things through different lenses than you ever did before, right? You, all of a sudden, when I became a dad and I held my, my first child, my daughter, in my arms, I, God's love for me became more real than all the countless times I read through the Bible and preached sermons and, and spoke to people and shared his love, all of a sudden that moment, holding my daughter, realizing the sacrifice that Jesus made for me, it, it just put on a whole new context for me on what God did. Because I knew in that moment that was something I could never do, right? The love that existed between me and my daughter um, uh, was very much the same type of love that God had for his son. And so that, that whole new level of faith and learning, and, and one of the things that, that just went through, another thing that went through the roof that I was actually getting to was, was my level of compassion rose when my kids were born. Because now I view things in the sense of, I wanna treat people like, what if my kid was lying on the side of the road? Would I want people just to pass them by? What if that's, what if it's my kid that's driving in the fast lane, right? And, and there's people behind them that are road raging and not paying attention and not thinking about who's in the car in front of them, you know? You just, you view life different when you have kids. I, I, I think we all do. But for this man, I think um, compassion wouldn't allow him just to pass by. There was something inside of him he was viewing life different in that moment. Something was stirred on the inside of him and he stopped and he rendered aid, right? Compassion stirred him. Any f- further thoughts on that before we move to the next one? I just want to echo what Pastor Steve said and it's the, uh, the need. And I like what you said is, is even though you may, the Bible doesn't say that, but that Samaritan may have, a, may have had a need, but he realized that this need of, his, of this person here on the side of the road, his needs were far greater than the need of him of himself so um he put his needs on hold and um i think that that lesson in itself is when you see somebody in need and their need is far greater than yours are you willing to put your needs on hold for the moment and it's interesting because uh, he put his needs on hold for two days Mm -hmm. the next day he still went over there so he put his needs on hold for for two days and said no matter what's happening with myself i'm willing to show compassion, put my needs aside, and take care of this person. I, yeah. I think I think that's that's an awesome uh, point that you brought out. And I mean, he didn't just just do the, the 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 limited part either. He didn't just take him for care. He also provided the finances that were needed for him to be restored. I mean, this Samaritan went above and beyond, you know, what what a lot of people would do. So he's showing not a lot of compassion. And I, I agree with what you said there, Gary, and I've told many people this, in, in having kids of my own, it really unlocks 
uh, a door in your heart to understand more the love of God for us and giving Jesus, uh, you know, as a sacrifice. Because as a parent, I, I totally have thought about that so many times. Mm -hmm. You know, God must really love us, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Right. And so, uh, but, but. Yeah, this Samaritan story, it's a powerful story of just, um, of just a, a man whose his heart is moved. He's, he's just moved with compassion, moved with love, moved with sympathy. Uh, and, and that could have been anybody's son on the side of the road. And like Gary said, I would, I would want somebody to stop and render aid. I don't care who it is. Please stop and help them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think let's bring that home. We live, look, at, look at the nation that we're living in right now, the circumstances that are being, I mean, just the, everything that's happened over the last two, three months, right? With the virus and uh, the economy shutting down and people losing jobs and people getting sick. Fact of the matter is we are surrounded by need everywhere right now. It doesn't matter what, what community you live in, what type of neighborhood you live in, what kind of job you have, uh, what's going on with your coworkers matters right now. There are people that are surrounding us every day that are in need. We know that there are millions of people without a job. We know that there are millions of people that are hungry. We know that there are millions of people that are, you know, it's not millions of people that are sick, but they're, they're, yeah. people have been affected by this virus. You know, we don't know really what that number is. And so, and so uh, there, is, there is ample reason for us to listen to those gut feelings in our, in our stomach right now. I think the Holy Spirit right now is stirring his people to pay attention, to open our eyes to those that are around us because there is need around us. And if we'll listen, if we'll acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is stirring us, um, it set, it'll set us up to really be able to minister the gospel to people and, and fill some needs uh, for folks. And which that, your, your point kind of leads us into the next one, and that is this, and it's found in verse 34, but compassion not only stirs us, but it also compels action, right? Look at verse 34. Going over to him, the, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. He put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him, right? Not only did he have compassion based on need rather than worth of the victim, but it caused him to feel something so deeply that he had to do something about it, right? It goes back to his compassion wouldn't allow him just to walk away from him, right? He, he took care of him. He went above and beyond. He doesn't just pass to the other side. He moved towards the injured man, and, and, and we must move towards people and express uh, action towards them. When we see it, if we have a neighbor right now that we know is out of a job, one of the discussions that ought to be taking place in our house is, what can we do? You know, if we're just being real and relevant to the world that we live in right now, people are out of jobs, right? Uh, people are sick. One of the conversations we ought to be having, I believe, is, and it is what we are having in my home, is what, what can we do? What are the needs around us? And how is God calling us, allowing us, uh, providing for us to fill some of those needs, Right? It's not something that just mystically happens. It's an effort. It is not always convenient, right? It's not always convenient. I think it kind of, and feel free to jump in, but it kind of goes back to your priority list, maybe with the first two guys. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, th I think we all have people that we know. Uh, they may be on our, uh, our street. They may be somebody in the church. They may be somebody that we work with or, you know, we, we all know people that are, are struggling right now. And even before all of this COVID and that type of thing, which has been, you know, an extra stress on a lot of people. Uh, but, but again, just seeing the need. And uh, Pastor Larry says it all the time, seeing the need, feeling the need. And I know a lot of times that's talking about service, but that's also talking about, you know, helping people as well. Uh, if you see a need in somebody's, um, maybe they did lose their job recently. We know of several that have lost their jobs and reaching out to them and asking them how, how you can help and, um, you know, providing a meal for uh, grieving families. And, and so there, there's just so much that we can do 
just to show the love of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus. And, uh, and again, it goes back to, you know, are, are we willing to, to take the time to do it? Uh, it? Like the Samaritan, you know, did. He, um, he, he took very good care of this guy. And he, and, he, and he finally, he pays the bill and he says, hey, if the bill runs any higher than this, I'll, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Uh, he didn't leave until that man was, was taken care of, that, that man was well. Uh, and I think that speaks to, uh, you know, that what a great example of, of, of compassion. You know, in today's society, we, we tend to be self-absorbed. It's all about us. I'm number one. And uh, once, once, you know, we are able to do just that, is once that compassion is stirred in our heart, once we see someone in need, or once we uh, are able to do something for somebody, you never know who's watching us. You may be in a position to show compassion to somebody and I don't even know who you are but I can be stirred by seeing that and then I can say to myself what can I do so I think it's important that even as believers even as you know we should be we should be able to do certain these things but when we're out in society and somebody sees us uh, maybe we're going down the road and somebody has uh, uh, not able to start their car and they're What's stopping us from getting out and then saying, hey, can, can I help you push your car to the side? And as people are, are, are going by us, you never know what that act is going to do for them for the rest of the yeah. day. Maybe it's going to help them to pay it forward. Maybe it's going to really sink into them. Hey, what can I do to help somebody? Just a simple act of kindness. Just showing some common courtesy can really uh, uh, help somebody stir their compassion throughout the rest of their day. And, and if I may add as well, I'm, I know we're talking about in the physical uh, you know, as far as this situation, but you know what? If, if 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 the Lord lays somebody on your heart, you haven't seen them in a while. There's nothing like getting that sweet little text, that little email, or that little phone call. I've I've received them myself from people who just have said, Pastor Steve, I just want you to know I'm thinking of you and praying. That means a ton. It yeah. really does. It goes a long way. So it's not just about finances, and it's also about just showing compassion and love and caring. I mean, it can be uh, put a card in the mail or just a phone call or a text message. You know, uh, we we can take this a lot further than just this story. Oh, absolutely. And well, and and I'm about to right along those lines. Because it, I, uh, think about this for a moment. We can't forget that the Samaritan is moving towards someone who, if he was conscious, would despise the man coming to render aid. Yeah. And most likely would not do the same if the roles were reversed. Mm -hmm. And he knows this. And here's the thought that came to mind. How many people have we held grudges against for a long time? We may not actually use the word enemy because we know that that's not right, but we know the people that we choose because of differences or arguments or slights uh, in the past, we choose not to associate with anymore. We don't pray for them. We don't, we don't want anything to do with them. And we have said that, we've told people that, we've told the Lord that, right? And, and what if this is a season where God is calling us to mend those fences. He is going towards a person that he knows. He had no, for all we know, no prior uh, meetings took place. They hadn't pr met prior to this circumstance on the road where they find themselves, but yet he is going to render aid to somebody that he knows not only if, he, if this guy was conscious, would he despise him, but as importantly, if the roles reversed, it, it, it probably wouldn't work out the same way. And yet he's doing it anyways, you know? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because this story, um, if you read it, and maybe it's, it's alluded to at the end, but Jesus never really answers that religious expert when he said, who's my neighbor? He never answered him. Instead, he went into a story. And I think that's important because if he indeed, in fact, would answer him, then it's almost like he's being exclusive. Well, who, who's your neighbor? Well, of the people that you like or the people that are in your neighborhood, or maybe the folks that are just uh, in your church family, but he doesn't do that. So when I see that he, Jesus never answered this, and he, instead he goes into w with the story, it's almost like Jesus is saying, everyone is your neighbor, right. and you have to show compassion just like this gentleman did. Yeah, yeah, it's not about race. It's not about economic status. It's not about anything. Everyone is your neighbor. And we're to love them and treat them, you know, as the golden rule says, treat others as you would have them treat you. And I've, I've 
preached on this before a long time ago, but I'm telling you, you talk about an answer, one scripture that sums up the answer to all of the issues that we're dealing with right now in America is if you just treat others the way that you want to be treated, you know, then matter of fact, I think the media wouldn't have anything to talk about. Maybe then they would talk about something good because there's good things going on all the time, but it seems like the focus is always on the bad. But, but just treat others the way that you want to be treated. Yeah, golden rule, right. right? Yeah. Jesus here details in about a series of six verbs just how, to, how active this man's compassion was. He says he went to him, he bandaged him, he poured oil and wine, he put him on his donkey, he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. Right, Six verbs there that detailed the length that this guy went to uh, to show mercy and compassion on him. He took the time to care. To care. And I think um, the point is, is that when we feel stirred, which compassion should stir us um, to move, the next part of that is that we actually have to move. Do something about it. And um, which brings to the next thing that I noticed about compassion here is that is this, is that it requires sacrifice. You know, you can do something about it, um, but in reality, it's gonna require some sacrifice from you. Look at verse 35. It says, on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii. This is another translation. He gave them to the innkeeper and he said to him, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. In other words, he was willing to go the extra mile. He was willing to do above and beyond um, what he was originally going to do. He was willing to take that extra step, right? He put no limit on how much he would spend. Did you? And I, and I, and I, I saw that in there, right? He didn't say up to a certain amount, up to five denarii, up to this much money, I'm willing to you know, repay. He put no limit on there. Whatever it is. I'll repay it when I, when I come back, right? How often do we attach limits to our sacrifice for those not in our inner circle? I'll do something, but I'm only gonna do so much. this much. Mm-hmm. I'll make the phone call, but don't expect me to go over there. I'll, I'll send the text message. I'll, I, I'll pray for them. Yeah. I'll pray for them, but... Um, I'm really busy, you know. Well, I, I've always heard <laughs> that uh, kids spell love, T-I-M-E, and I think it's also applicable to adults, you know. Time is important, and that is a sacrifice for a lot of people because we are it busy. Is. We have Absolutely. tight schedules, and, you know, uh, <clears throat> it's hard enough sometimes to make time for our own families and, and to squeeze in things that our kids want to do and that type of thing, but... But, uh, but yeah, he makes a huge sacrifice of time here. And he goes and he puts him up for the night. You know, we don't know what this man had on his schedule, but he put it all aside to meet this need. And I think about, Gary, what you're talking about, you know, even back on that golden rule uh, in John, uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 31, do, a, do to others as you would like them to do to you. But that next few verses, and Pastor Larry mentioned this last week, and I hope I'm not stealing your thunder on this, but he says, you know, if you love only those who love you, why should you get any credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners do that much. He's talking about that inner circle. You know, if you're just only doing good for your, your friends, then, you know, everybody does that. Uh, and so, um, but to have compassion on someone that may not look like you or may not act like you or may not be from around here, maybe you don't know, uh, that just speaks volumes of what God is talking about there. I also think about that scripture at the end of chapter 6, uh, verse 36, he, he says this, Jesus says, you must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. And you think about the compassion that God has had for us, you know, that's how he wants us to be compassionate to people. Yeah. No, it's very true. Very, very true. And, uh, you know, we, he's given us more than we deserve. That's right. Compassion, mercy, forgiveness, you know, second, third, 100 chance, you know, yeah. to get this life right. And, um, and if he's willing to give it to us, then we have to be willing to give it to others, yeah. regardless of the situation. You know, and I, and I think that's kind of the bottom line with Jesus Christ and who he is with us. 
I'm thankful that he didn't have uh, uh, limitations on how much love he was going to show us. Right. Well, I'm gonna, only going to help you, Steve, only to this point, and then after that, you're on your own. I'm only going to help you, Adam, up until this point, and after that, you need to make your decision on what you want to do. I'm glad that Jesus didn't do that for me. And I think knowing that, I think knowing that, that, that should stir something in our lives to say, well, I, I, I should probably learn and I should probably reverse some of these trends of what we've kind of been taught in, in, in society and unteach that and say, kind of like the whole, what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. That's it. Go over and beyond. Do, do, the, do the unthinkable when it goes to helping somebody. And then, and then you know, just let the Lord then uh, bring blessings to everybody from there. No, it's good. It's good. There is no limit on how much we ought to sacrifice for those um, that God, you know, brings our way. Compassion requires sacrifice. Here's the uh, last and final point is this. Compassion, it, it tethers us to God. It links us to God. Look. Verse 36, at the conclusion of his story, he asked the lawyer one additional question. Verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And the lawyer here kind of chokes on his own word. He, his own words, he cannot even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. So he responds in verse 37 with this, he who showed mercy to him. And for the second time, Jesus tells this man to do something. Go and do, the, do likewise. Go and do the same. In other words, it's great that you recognize my point. Jesus is in, in essence telling him, it's great that you got the point of the story, right? That you have put two and two together. Now complete the equation by acting upon it. Go and do something about it, right? The lawyer left, out, left without any excuses or any vindication of what he wanted. The second question that the lawyer had asked was, who is my neighbor? Jesus here turned, turned the, the stone over. He flipped the coin over, if you will, uh, and flipped the question over. In essence, it doesn't say this, but in my thought, Jesus was getting him to answer the question, what kind of neighbor am I? You know, not who is my neighbor, which is what the lawyer asked. He's like, who is my neighbor? What Jesus is really wanting him to ask himself is what kind of neighbor am I? What kind of neighbor am I to the people that I live around? If I see need and don't act upon it, what kind of neighbor am I to people that cross my path every day that, that, are, that are in need um, that I don't show mercy to? What does that say about my, it's not a real word, but it, maybe it works, neighborship, you know? What does it say about my ability to be a good neighbor, you know? First John 3, 16, one of the most convicting passages in my mind in all the Bible reads this way. First John 3, 16, we know what real love is because Jesus gave, his, gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has put enough money to has enough money to live well and sees someone in need but shows no compassion. Anybody know how that next part goes? How can God's love be in that person? How can God's love be in that person. Verse 18 says, let's not merely say that we love each other, but let us show the truth by our actions. Mm. So in essence, Jesus is speaking to priorities. Yeah. Because I would imagine everybody that sits in this church on a Sunday morning, by and large, are compassionate people. Mm -hmm. they, God has moved in their heart. They have at times in their life met needs, whatever that may have looked like, um, they would probably consider themselves compassionate people. But Jesus puts a whole new stamp on it here. The word of God does. But he who shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person, right? I don't think it's meant to, you know, God's not trying to put his thumb on us and 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 make us feel like awful people. 
You know, that's, that's not a loving heavenly father. But the word of God is there to convict. It is there to renew. It is there to help us see things in a new light. And if we, are, we find ourselves constantly going past people and not showing mercy, not being aware of the situations around us, choosing to be indifferent uh, to neighbors and to situations and, to, and so forth, I think it is relevant then for us to ask ourselves, not only what kind of neighbor am I, but how deep does the love of God really flow into my heart? Are there areas of my heart that I have barricaded off? You know, have I completely pushed out people groups or am I so consumed with myself and my life that, that I can't be bothered with the things that the Lord may be asking me to do? It's a great challenge. That's, that's what Jesus is doing here. He's, 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 Preaching truth to the man says, he says, yes, now go and do the same. But it's also a challenge. You know, listen, it's, it's, it's easy to talk the talk. It's harder to put that into action. And we have to be deliberate in that. We have to be intentional in, in, our, in, in, in showing compassion. Uh, and I agree with you. I believe our church is a very compassionate church. We're such a giving church, such a missional church, such a yep. multicultural church, a beautiful church, a beautiful picture, in my opinion, of heaven. I mean, that's what heaven's going to be. Exactly right. As we all gather around the throne, nationalities, and, and it's going to be beautiful. And, and as Pastor Larry spoke on this past Sunday, God loves diversity. If he didn't love diversity, he wouldn't have made it that way. Right. Okay? And, and so we have to embrace that. And, and um, I was just thinking to myself, you know, um, as people, we look at things that happen around us, uh, you know, through what they call a worldview. You know, you, you develop a worldview, a lens. You, you look at things through a lens. And some people look through the lens of, you know, uh, uh, social status. You know, they see everything from a social status. Some, some people, and let's be honest, see things through a race status. Everything's about race. But as Christians, we need to see things through a Christian status lens through a Christian worldview, a Christian status. What would Jesus do? You nailed it right there when you mentioned that. That, that fad is not gone. Matter of fact, that fad needs to come back. And, and I, I would be glad to wear that shirt proudly, wear that armband again, because if, if there's ever a time, right now is the time that Christians need to stop. What worldview am I looking through? What am I seeing this situation through? Am I seeing it through the eyes of Christ? because that's the way I should be. Because you're my brother, you're my sister, we may all look different, but we are all the same right. in Jesus Christ. That's you right. know. And what would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus react? What would Jesus say? Would Jesus, and let's take this a step further into application today. Would Jesus post this on Facebook? Would Jesus, will this help the situation? Yeah. Will this bring peace to the situation or will this create more divide if I, po if I post or repost or whatever it is? Will it help the situation? I believe Jesus would quicken our hearts and say, hey, that's not going to help. What you need to share is love, peace, unity, right. you know, so. Compassion. Compassion. Yeah. yeah. You know, also one of the things I want to add, and I think that's excellent of what you said, uh, Pastor Steve, but in getting past those barriers, am I willing to even take that next step? Am I willing to be vulnerable for Jesus? Am I willing to just put myself out there knowing that maybe I'm having issues with my brother or my sister or maybe that's just not me doing something like this, but do I love Jesus that much that I'm willing to, to go outside myself and be vulnerable for him? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I love what Frederick Book, um, Butchner said in his book, Wishful Thinking. He's, he, he defines, he, he answers the question, what is compassion. And this is what he said. Compassion is the sometimes fatal capacity for feeling what it is like to live inside someone else's skin. It is the knowledge that there can be, that there can never really be any peace and joy for me until there is peace and joy finally for you too. In other words, I'm willing to do life with you. I'm willing to walk beside you. You know, it really kind of hones in on the difference. There's a, we, we hear these two terms all the time in church, um, loving people and loving on people. 
there's a, there, there's a, a great difference between those two terms, loving people and loving on people. Loving people requires time. It requires sacrifice, right? Because you're saying to them, I'm going to walk you through this situation. I'm going to walk you through this pain. I'm going to walk you through life. I'm going to, I'm going to be an encourager to you. I'm going to be there for you whenever you need, right? Whereas loving on people is, is, is very much a short-term commitment, right? You might just um, uh, say, well, I'll, be, I'll, I'll pray for you. That's loving on somebody. Um, an encouraging word, that's loving on somebody. And there's nothing wrong with, with any of that. But when Christ calls us to love people, it's not meant to be a short-term commitment. It's not meant to be a, a, a one-time thing. It's meant to be a, a life, um, I don't want to call it a partnership, but a willingness, a sacrifice, a, a willingness to say, I've got you. You can count on me. I'll be there, right? And too often we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, and, and all of those things um, because of time, of co other commitments, of everything go else going on. And I, and I think God's just calling us to maybe step back and reevaluate those priorities you started off with. You know, is compassion and mercy high enough up on our list of, of importance as it should be. Jesus, when he walked this planet and he talked to people and he, I mean, he was more compassionate on his disciples than they probably deserved. <laughs> the people he walked with every day, you know. Um, but he was just a compassionate soul. And um, I think it gives us something to live up to and to look up to and to work towards. So, um, compassion stirs us, it moves us to action, it, 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 it requires sacrifice, and compassion tethers, tethers us to God. All of that means is this, that when we take a moment and we see a need, and we're willing to step into that need, it does something for us in our walk with God. It does something to us in our relationship with the Father. Do you agree with that? Yeah, it, it does. It does. Go ahead. Well, James said that faith without works is dead. Yeah. And, uh, and works, in, in other words, action is going to follow the Christian faith. If you have a true faith in Christ, if you have a true love for Christ, just like 1 John 3.16 said, then, then you are going to show compassion. You are going to show the traits of Christ. You are going to love others. You are going to be kind. You're going to be gentle. You're going to show the fruits of the Spirit, you know. And listen, we all struggle sometimes. We're not all perfect. But it gives us a challenge. You know, God, help us to do more. Help us to be more. Help us to remember in those situations where our, our, our tempers or, you know, our anger is high to Whoa, let's put on gentleness. Let's put on peace. Let's put on goodness. Let's, let's show love. Let's show compassion. And uh, it's a challenge for all of us. It is. No, it very much is. You know, one thing that I don't want to go with a false motive. If I'm willing to help somebody, I shouldn't be asking myself, what am I going to get out of this? Right. And I think that if we approach helping people or trying to be there as a brother or as a mentor, with looking at what's going to be the payment, I think we're looking at it all wrong. And I think that if we're going in there with just a pure heart, just a being compassion, just wanted to, everything that you've talked about, I truly believe that once we look at it with no strings attached, I'm just going to go and, and be love and show love, I think that a lot of the things that we pray for are then going to be answered because the Lord sees that. But I think if we're putting stipulations on, well, I'm going to help this person because I want to, I want to point or I'm going to help this person because I want another, I want another uh, jewel in my crown. I'm not sure that's the, the right way of looking at it. I'm just going to go out there. And I'm just going to be Jesus to somebody. Yeah. And what would Jesus do? And I think that once, we're, once we do that, a lot of these things that we pray for, whether it's issues with, with family, issues with, uh, with, with brothers, maybe work, maybe I'm looking for just the right position for the Lord to put me in, I think the Lord then he gives us those blessings. I think that he repays us in that way. But I can't put stipulations on, on just doing something because I want, I want a payment from it. Yeah, I think in closing, I think we just need to ask ourselves, 
what kind of neighbor am I? What kind of neighbor am I? Can we ask ourselves that just for a moment? What kind of neighbor am I? Am I, am I showing love and compassion and mercy to the people that God has put around me on a regular basis that I, that I, that I cross as I walk into the grocery store or at my place of business? What kind of neighbor am I being? And here's the, here's the, here's the three things I want to leave you with. Who is God right now speaking to your heart about? Who is the person in your life that needs compassion and mercy? The person that the Holy Spirit's speaking to your heart right now. Who is that person? And what kind of commitment will you make to the Lord about reaching out to them? The kingdom requires involvement. Are you involved? And here's the third thing. God is calling us to love our city. Our city um, that is... uh, uh, just in need of love right now. And it's time to find a place to serve. And, and where is God asking you to step up and help? Who are you supposed to show compassion to and mercy to? So listen, we, uh, we appreciate any final thoughts as we, as we close. No. All right. You join us in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for, um, God just speaking to our hearts. Lord, help us to to be very open and honest and vulnerable with ourselves and honest with the Holy Spirit. Lord, what kind of neighbor am I being right now? What kind of neighbor am I to those that are around me? What kind of neighbor am I to those that, that you, that you cross my path with every day? God, am I indifferent? Am I on my own? Am I preoccupied with other things? Are my priorities elsewhere? Or God, or are they they where they need to be? Lord, would you speak to our hearts? Would you open our hearts up to those that are around us? Would you open our eyes and, and, and allow us to see people the way that you do? Not with color or socioeconomic status or anything else, but God, to see people the way you do. Give us eyes of compassion and mercy, Lord, that we can act upon them and do the things that you're calling us to do to be great examples for you in this life. We love you, Lord. Speak to our hearts about who it is, God, you want us reaching out to. Maybe the phone call or the text message, whatever it is, Jesus. Speak to our hearts right now. Not just stir us, but God, give us the compassion deep enough to move on it. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, Central, we just want to say thank you for joining us in this Bible study. And and the challenge has been made, and uh, I encourage you to take that step this week and, and just look for opportunities to share Christ's love, to show compassion to others. And, and uh, you know, if you want to share that on uh, Facebook, uh, the social media, let us know what God is doing because God will do something great and mighty through that, and uh, we're believing for that. So great study, Pastor Gary, uh, Pastor Adam, and uh, thank you for joining us. Don't forget to be with us this weekend. Uh, we will have services here at 9 a.m., 11, 15. Uh, also, uh, be sure and look at the, uh, the schedule for our children's ministry and all the things that are going on there online and, and be a part. And, and let me just say this, on behalf of Pastor Larry and our church staff and all of us here, we love you. Uh, we love our church family. We're so thankful for each one of you, and we're praying for you, and we can't wait till we see all of you. We've seen a lot of you, and it's always good just to be together to give that high five or that hug, but, but we love all of you, and we're thinking all of you, and we miss those who haven't been here yet, and we hope to see you real soon. God bless you. Have a great week. Bye-bye.